Thanks, everybody. I think we're ready to start. I think we got a nice, big, full house this evening. Um, and I think there's nothing greater than to start with a picture of a book on a screen and kind of convert it into another form of media. Um, and I'm sure Lars will talk about plenty of that tonight. Um, it's, it's an absolute uh, delight and pleasure to, to, uh, to welcome Lars back to the AA. Lars Boybrecht is a frequent visitor and critic here, as many of you will know, who comes in and looks at the work of, from across the school at various times when his very busy schedule allows. Um, and it's, it's been a little while since he's had an opportunity to present the work, so I think it's great that, that he's found time to come over and do that. Um, <coughs> you all will know Lars really at the forefront um, as a young architect who's at the forefront really of what used to be called digital architecture um, and what's increasingly just called architecture um, and, and is the member, member of a generation that's really and I think in a profoundly personal way worked through um, in his own biography and career what that transition has and continues to mean within architectural culture. I mean, long before Lars became so well known for the kinds of projects that he'll be presenting tonight, Lars, Lars was part of an architectural culture um, within the Netherlands and, and specifically from Rotterdam where he's been working for 15 years that he was a member of a group of people that brought architectural ideas to architectural culture there through journals, through writing, through translations. Lars uh, and the people that he's worked with over the years were the first group of people to translate ideas that at the time were incredibly important in cultural practice and production into the language there and into the discussion that was taking place amongst a group of young architects and artists, media experimenters and other people. Um, I think one of the great ironies of, of Lars's own body of work is, is an interest that can be founded in new media and digital practices at a key moment in its development leads to an incredible rethinking of what we would call material or the physical stuff of the world. And that's certainly one of the things that his work continues to focus on, <coughs> which is, let's say, the way in which um, what becomes initially an investigation and exploration of the possibilities of new digital tools, techniques, machinic systems that we would associate with them can allow us the means to rethink the idea of material itself as a kind of computation. And in fact, what it really signals is a paradigm shift towards a form of computation in which the distinction between what we call the material, the, the physical stuff of the world, and the information coding systems that are a part of software just becomes a continuous spectrum and in fact can be understood through, through uh, a disciplined approach to what computation itself involves as both processes and, and methods. Um, Lars begins writing and doing projects in about 1991, 92, and has been doing so pretty much 24 hours a day since then. Um, you will know his projects like V2 Lab, one of the early projects that Knox did, D Tower, more recently a project like Son of House, which is testing these at an increasingly larger and, and ambitious scales of production and installation and occupation. He has uh, taught and published widely at a lot of different places around the world. Um, and most recently, those writings have culminated in, in the book that's on the screen right now, Machining Architecture, which came out, I think, almost exactly this time last year, autumn 2004, um, which is really, uh, was designed and is beautifully executed as a good deal more than just a monograph of his work. It really is a kind of working manual of the kinds of experiments, practices, images, techniques, um, and research agendas that sit alongside and are embedded within some of his projects. It's a remarkable kind of manual in its own rights. It's got writing by people like Manuel Delanda assessing the work that he's been doing. Uh, one of our lecturers next week, Detlef Mertens, has got a piece in there, Andrew Benjamin and several other people. I recommend it fully as, a, as an incredibly um, important summary of where these kind of explorations are right now. Um, in addition to all of the work he's doing, um, of course, he's also well known as a teacher around the world and is a professor at University of Kassel in Germany where he also heads the CAD and digital production department within that university in terms of, in addition to teaching studios and is currently a visiting professor at Columbia University where he's carrying some of these experiments forward in a different form. Please join me in welcoming Lars Spoybrook. Well, that was nice. Um, 
Yeah, this materialism. There's this. There's this amazing text in the book by uh, by Detlef Mertens. Where is Detlef? Oh, where's my laser pointer? Uh, Detlef over there. And this bioconstructivism text. There's. Uh, he read this book. He starts like the reading of the book by Helmut Müller Sievers on self generation. On self generation. It's an amazing book. It's a German guy who works at Princeton. And. Uh, and it's, it's sort of centered around the time of Kant and, and Goethe. And basically this, this whole, oh thanks, thanks. This whole idea of materialism as a, as a self-computational flow of force, as something that is technological by itself almost, right? That, uh, that is active, is actually an idea from the 1740s, 50s, 60s. And at that time, it was called epigenesis, epigenesis, not morphogenesis, epigenesis. And it was opposed. It was opposed to, to the idea of preformation. And basically, preformation. You have to understand it. Like in architecture, preformationists are the typologists, right? So preformation in biology means that there's no embryological development in the sperm. There's a little human being. It's planted in the in the female womb, and it grows. And there it comes. So there's no development. There's just a scaling up. And, and with the start of biology and the start of chemistry, right, there's just suddenly there's this idea that movement is in matter. That's how Diderot says it. And it's like 1770, the boss of enlightenment says, movement is in matter. That's, that's like a pure quote from Deleuze. It's, it's an amazing sentence. And they turn against Descartes because Descartes said, that matter was inert and had to be shaped from the top down or from the heavens, right? Had to be according to the hylomorphic model that, that Manuel de Landa is always sort of working with. It's shaped from the outside. So God was an architect, right? The God of William Blake is an architect. It's a, there's this bearded guy in the sky with a compass and a ruler. Shaping inert, stupid matter, clay, right? And that changes. That changes with, with people like Diderot and Coleridge, right? A, a bit later, 1810, he has this amazing, amazing quote of, of that form should be innate, that form should be growing out of the material, uh, not be imposed from the top, from the outside in, not from the top down, but from the outside in. So the, there's, this, there's this huge break. There's this huge break during Kant, during Goethe, that breaks with this harmonic, divine model of matter being shaped according to proportion, axiality, whatever. So, that's what the book is about. <laughs> it's, it's, such, it's such an amazing idea. Let me just introduce myself. This is what I, this is what I do, art, architecture, and research. Of course, it's much more messy than that, but of, since, it's so <laughs> since it is a book, you have to present it in such a way that it, that it sort of clarifies things. So, But there, there is a very interesting relationship between the research and architecture. It's indirect, and it goes through art. Basically, I cannot do the architectural projects without the art projects. Right? The architectural projects always have very sharp deadlines. The, uh, the budgets are very tight. The clients are totally different, and the art, they're nice clients, they're mostly more rich. If you're a year late, they are happy because they, they think you have more inspiration or whatever. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, the research that comes out of the teaching, right, at Columbia and in, and in Kassel, and at, let's say, PhDs that work at my office and then come back as my, uh, my assistants at the uh, and the schools, basically, you, we build channels, right, of knowledge and experiments. But that doesn't work directly. It works through the artworks. It works through the artworks. So I'm showing a few of the artworks, and of course, they're clearly related to architecture. But they don't have doors or toilets or windows. But they, they are extremely architectural, especially in the bodily experience. And on that level of technology, right, these, these art projects are are basically the, 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 the door between the research and the, and the architecture. <coughs> now let me get back to that, that argument. Um, 
of, uh, of uh, epigenesis because I, I want to do two things here tonight. First, I want to explain how that can happen in architecture and why we should not just animate flocks on the screen and stop the screen and say now it's a museum. Why, why that, why morphogenesis or the thinking of emergence is inherently constructive, right? Why, why is it, it is a constructivism and why, why it's not a, a formal technique but much more a structural technique. Saying that, I also want to say that now I'm actually moving to much more control. So first I, I sort of tried to use movement, which was in the first projects extremely wild, right? And that got more constrained through these techniques that I will show now, these, these, these morphogenetic uh, analog computing techniques that is now developing more to what I call here a configurationalist technique. Configurationalism is, is a word often used in Gestalt and it's actually much more like an aesthetic control of the movement. So there's not pure movement and be absorbed by systems, but the movement is much more, let's say, sets of figures that together configure into a system. So that's why there's, there's Fry Otto over here, which is, uh, let's say, the wild side of absorbing movement, and there's Zemper here, which is the more controlled side of, of, of absorbing movement. They're both textile images, by the way. Now let me start by, by Fry Otto. I met Fry Otto in, in 98, and that was, a, that was a huge shock to me because he was basically was doing what we were, we thought we were the first, right? He was doing it for 40 years already and he was doing it much better, right? And he was doing it with material systems. And I, I, have heard, I had heard of analog computing, right? But I, have never, I had never realized that actually in architecture, the history of morpho, morphogenesis or morphogenetic design techniques were actually analog machining techniques. Of course, Gaudi, right, with the catenary techniques, with the hanging chains, is a, a analog computing technique per se, right? You, there's hardly a better example. We see Gaudi as, as sort of the Walt Disney of architecture, which he's not. He's actually the first computer architect. He's actually the first computer architect. And, and having the plan of the Sagrada Familia, right, based on the body of Christ, hanging on the ceiling instead of on the table in front of you and then drawing elevations. He was actually having it on the ceiling of the studio and then hanging the chains, right, from the points. Well, actually ropes with sandbags, considered as chains. He was hanging the chains and, and locking them into each other, generating the form of the Sagrada Familia, which is actually, uh, an emergent form. If you only have like a few catenary lines, these of course you could calculate in the 1890s and, and 1900s. But the interesting thing is that when you get more and more and more, they start to iterate, right? And influence each other and interact with each other. And that, out of that comes a form that you cannot draw. So it's, it's a purely generative technique. Now Fry Otto worked on that in all kinds of fields, all kinds of fields. And this is, this is an especially interesting example because, of course, Fry Otto always worked with architects who already had a plan and basically he had to do the elevation or the roof or whatever. There was always this huge separation. And this is actually a, an example of Fry Otto's work, which is a plan. So he's calculating uh, the plan, in this case of a city. This is really amazing. He says, okay, a city consists of houses that are connected by roads. So there you, are, there you have the houses, and he connects each house with every other house with a road. And this is really important because it's, it's really important that it starts so stupid, right? It starts so extremely rigorous. So you see, there's a house, and you connect it to every other house because that's what a city does, right? Connects each point to every other point. Then he says, yeah, but if you, if you go to the supermarket or to your grandmother or whatever, there's no way you can go straight. Only with certain addresses you can go straight, but with most addresses you have to detour, right? So in this, in this city, the average amount of detouring is 8%. What does he do? This, he lengthens the lines by 8%. So this could still be drawn, right? That could be still drawn top down. 
It's the systematics of a city, but here it's not ink anymore, it's actually wool. There we would read generally, after Peter Eisman, we would read this stage as the deconstructivist stage. Right? It's just a messing up of a classic order. A messing up of a classic order. Now that's absolutely not what, what Fraiotto is interested in. So what does he do? He, he takes the system, he dips it underwater, he shakes a bit, movement, right? and he takes it out. And when you take it out, actually it gathers water. Right? And where it gathers water, it contracts because of the cohesive forces in the water. And it contracts and it contracts till it can do no further, <laughs> till all the overlength, till all the slag is used up. So first, when you have that one on a ring, right, the wool threads are hanging like this, and you dip it in water, you take it out, it comes out flat and horizontal. That's that one. Same performance as that one. The lines still go from A to B, right? But in a totally different network, in a totally different ne network. Now for me to see that with Fayotta was, was really an amazing moment because what I said is like in the 1995, we were all using Swarm 1.0 from the Santa Fe Institute and having the swarms on our screens and just stopping and stopping and saying, now it looks like a post office and now it looks like a museum and now it looks like a tower, whatever, right? And this cured me of pure bottom-upism or pure kipnicism, right? <laughs> this, it, it actually, I, it made me understand that this is actually a new way of looking at typology. Not a typology as an archive of forms, but a, of a systemacy that is inherently flexible and, and topological, right? Like how Manuel de Ronda describes the body plan, right? Of course there is a body plan for a mammal or for an insect or for whatever, and these, and these body plans, they differ. They differ in kind. Now, this is a different kind. This is a city. It's not a, it's not a skyscraper, <laughs> right? It's not a holiday house. So this type is different than the other types. There is a difference in kind. And this machine, which, is, which of course it is, right, needs a certain amount of flexibility, topology, redundancy, to actually generate, actualize a form. So the abstract is actually real. That is so interesting. This is not an ideal city sent by Plato down on Earth, right, to become a whatever city. No, this is actually, it is a, an organizational stage, right, but in reality. So that's so interesting is that, that this is not the ideal state, but it's, it's a virtual stage, but then as part of the real. So it needs differentiation. It needs differentiation. And it actualizes from here to there to there. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now everybody says, well, here we have the classic opposition between necessity and chance, right? Mies and, and Cage, or Mies and Pollock, or whatever. But that's not true, because in, the, in let's say, that after the war period, all, all these chance projects were seen as deconstructions of necessity. Right? In this case, this is not breaking up that order, it's actually improving it. There's a lot more information in this one than in that one. To describe this one, you need four sentences. Right? To describe this one, you need three or four pages. So there's a, there's a huge amount of information in this one. There's an increase of order. There's an increase of order, and the increase goes with hierarchy. Hierarchy, lines that, that merge become a line, a thick line. Lines that keep on crossings are surfaces. Lines that don't cross at all make holes. So zero dimension, one dimension, two dimension. There is a hierarchy, right? But it's, it's a bottom-up hierarchy. It's a bottom-up order. So this is actually, this is what I would call constructivism. It's not the best term, but it's, it's a fully constructivist procedure. That means that everything that is generative, everything that is, that is, uh, emergent, that happens within a material realm, by its nature has to be constructivist, right? So the moment when it gets a form, it gets a structure. It's not that you get a form first and then access a moment to put columns in, right? It is inherently structural, it is inherently structural. My simplest machine is, is this one 
which is a is a skyscraper and there's actually a number of them like 14 14 wool threads hanging loose 21 centimeters then dipped in water and they make this network they make this network of diagonals so that you can rotate around turn upside down you get that one so that's 520 meters this is 21 centimeters <laughs> so the, the, of course it goes from the real to the real but there's this this huge scaling issue in analog computing right if the wool threads would be different you would have to scale the machine different and maybe use something else as water so the actual let's say the cohesion the cohesive forces of the water that keep the diagonals and then the weight of the of the heavy wool threads right dragging on on the diagonals and the nodes to actually loosen there's this there's this fantastic balance over here so that all depends on these materials. So this is actually a vertical, it's actually a vertical tower. It's actually straight. It's actually straight. It's not using diagonals to deconstruct straightness, but it is a virtual straightness because it's the, it's the line of, it's a virtual line, a sort of center line of gravity. So it's, it's actually straight, but it's again, it's a, a bottom-up straightness. Now, the, the problem, which I just want to put in your mind, and I, I hope to solve with some later projects, is, of course, suppose you would be uh, talking to, uh, this is the WTC, you would talk to, uh, is it Spiegelman or the owner of Silverstein or whatever, Silverstein, and he would actually say, well, that's interesting, you would explain these sky lobbies and the nodes, and, and you would say, well, there's 21 of these, and they function like uh, subway stations, and there would be uh, restaurants, whatever, cinemas. It's almost like a vertical urbanism. And he says, well, that's interesting, but I just need uh, 14 of these nodes, not 21. That's a serious problem, because that's a <laughs> dipping. <laughs> you can, it's hardly possible to do 50,000 dips right and then and then have the final tower right that's not possible so that that's where the digital comes back we do actually these analog studies not really as experiments to but to learn the rules so what are the angles how diagonal can they be how do they lock into each other what kind of three or four legged nodes do you get if you if you get if you know that actually you can build a digital machine with a button you can actually say six or eight or 14 whatever so that's for me how how the, the digital actually returns in a form of control. <coughs> now, one of the extremer projects is the is the Sono House, uh, an art project, an art project, and it, it started again with this study of uh, of uh, of slack, but it, we had three paper strips and we would pre-cut them according to, uh, let's say, movements based on uh, habits in a house. The longer cuts have the potential to make rooms, the smaller cuts would be like uh, furniture, and the, the tiny cuts would be like drawers. So there's a whole scaling of movements, body movements to limb movements to actually hand and foot movement. So these are, are cut, so they have a potential to create spaces. The moment, these three strips are then on the table, right? They're just flat. And then they're clipped together with a, with a staple, with a staple, right? Each in the middle of the cut. When you do that, it curls up by itself, right? So that the paper actually elevates, right? It elevates, because here the paper doesn't know which part will be on the ground, will, which part will be in the ceiling, and which part will be in the wall, right? <laughs> So you get these, these very complex interlacing systems of arches, because that's what they are, they're arches, paper arches. And they, they, they're not like modeled. Basically the curves are just connecting all the points through continuity, right? They calculate, they calculate the differential curve, right, by connecting all the staples. So that's a, that, there you get that system. <coughs> So it's, it's a line with multiple forms of slack, right? This, has a, this one has another slack than that one and that one. 
But if you have that white paper model, that's clearly that's a diagram, right? It's a structural diagram. It's not a formal diagram or a circulational diagram. It's a structural diagram. It's still an issue, let's say, how do you move that diagram in art, in what it's going to be, or in, in a sort of public artwork? In this case, I decided to actually use that, use that white paper to inform another set of paper, purple paper. It's like, a, it's like sets of surfaces. With a small algorithm, it would actually, it would follow the tangent of the white paper and tries to connect to something at the end of the paper. So this paper comes out so vertical, it doesn't find anything till it's on the edge of the board. But here it finds something immediately, so it clips here. What do you get? A tail, right? So here we get a surface, almost like curled hair, right? You would have one set of hairs in one curl, and then you get the next curl and the next curl. So that makes a whole system which is porous, right? A system of tearings that is immediately derived from the, from the white paper model. In the end, the white paper just disappears in this one, but if we would put it right in there, you would see it like follow exactly in these, in these curves. But these curves are now not arches anymore, but they're domes, right? They're domes. And actually, there's a whole topology of domes because what is a dome here is not really a dome here anymore. You see here is actually the curvature of the white paper is over here. It increases in curvature. It increases in curvature. Why? Because the dome transforms into a column. Basically, the dome starts standing up, right? This is a standing up by curling, by an extra curling. So you would have paper, you would curl it, right? It would actually cantilever with less curvature at the end. So you get this hugely complex system of vaults interlacing and opening. <coughs> yeah, the, st the structure surface issue will, will return uh, uh, a few times. This is, let's say, the, the dumbest way that you can structure such an object. Is you basically, you just, you just grid it from the top down. So you just slice it like a, like a sausage in two directions. And of course, the, the, the technologism is, is incredible because uh, the, that curvature, you can nest, right? This is basically the same object. These 21 panels of six by two meters, a centimeter thick and stainless steel is basically the same information as this one. It's the same object, it's the same object. 21 of these plates and then you get a laser cutter that cuts them out, so we don't even do dimension drawings, right? We never had a drawing saying uh, 9.42 meters or something. It's just cut, and everything fits. Clearly, you have to number them, <laughs> right? <It's laughs> but it's in the book without the number, so anybody who is a bit depressed for Christmas <laughs> can sort of print this on cardboard. I'm not sure if you guys see this, but there's, there's nesting software, right? If you put these curves with nesting software on a plate, they fully nest, but only if you have an infinite plate. This is actually done with, with interns. <laughs> <laughs> so, and how does that work? You, you, they nest groups of similar curvature. They nest them in each other, right? So that's, that's what you get here. But of course, most of these get off the board. Then you cut them, which not nesting software cannot do, right? And the, and the piece that you cut, you put on another board, on another panel. And that actually worked very, very well. And, this, and you can always get like two of these crystals per panel, and then this, the rest is filled up with diagonals and small stuff. So it's, it's pretty simple. And, we, and it was really important because a centimeter thick stainless steel, this is actually very special compound of stainless steel, so it's hugely expensive, hugely expensive. If you look in the book, there's another project we did years ago, was it was in Nantes called the Wet Grid, that was in wood. And of course, to put it together costs money too. So in Nantes, we almost had like one piece per panel. We just threw 70% of the wood out because of the gluing, the gluing of the, of the wood was so expensive. In this case, 
Of course, it's expensive to weld all these pieces back together, but not as expensive as throwing away stainless steel. So there's a, there's a whole economy. And this is actually, f as we only lose 4% of stainless steel, which is quite something. And that fits, so that fits. There's a sensor, there's a speaker. There's 20, 23 speakers and there's 25 sensors the other way around, infrared sensors. And the infrared sensors track the movements. So this idea of the movement, how actually how that body occupies the space is actually tracked by sensors. So the machining technique itself returns digitally in the, in the project, right? So it's completely, con continuously reactivating the space by sound. Now this is, this is done by Edwin van der Heide. I, I already worked with him for the water pavilion and there he just made a CD with sounds. And with the, with the sensors you could sort of sample the sounds and throw them through the space or make them louder or whatever. In this case he did something completely different. He did a, a, a system of sounds, actually a composition, but not an actual composition, just relationships. If you would change one of the elements, the relationships would change the whole. So it's always self-composing. It's always, suppose you would have the Goldberg algorithm, right? And you would, you would actually generate not just 36 Goldberg variations, but 3600, right? That would be extremely interesting. So, well, this is electronic music, so it's not as melodic and as interesting as, uh, as Bach. So it, it's, this is a system of, of interference of sound. And what's interesting, because of the interference of the frequencies, you get the effect of movement, right? Like with a moiré pattern, a visual moiré pattern. So even when you stand still, you get the movement of the, of the sound continuously. So there's this continuous effect, this looping, of architectural information of continuity and, and the information of the, of the sound. Basically, they're each other's diagram almost. So these are looking at the movements and, and this is producing the sound. <coughs> and the surface is, is a bit more tricky. Um, for the surface, we had a thousand of these strips, uh, strips of two meters long and 17 centimeters wide in, in expanded metal, expanded metal. And of course, if you, these are industrial cu cuts, so these are all standard, these are all standard strips. Clearly, that's a, it's a very difficult object to cover, right? <laughs> Especially when you spend already, let's say, two thirds of your budget on the structure. What we actually did was a sort of boating technique, but a, a variable boating technique. So planks, planks that would actually close up. If you would have double curvature, because it's all double curvature, if the, the two curves of the double curvature are similar, like a sphere, nine, nine strips would actually close into a hexagon, right? And of course, number seven is crucial. So you get the six, and then this length is not changed because the curves are the same. It actually closes up and numbers eight and nine follow. But if these curves are not the same, right, if that one is longer and that's shorter curvature, you see number seven doesn't fit, it's moved back. We don't cut it off because that's labor, right? We move it back, yeah. we move it back and numbers eight and nine follow. So you get this sort of flexible crystallization, almost like a, like a basket weaving. We also have flexible techniques, but here they, of course, the flexibility is in sort of in a breaking, a breaking of the hexagon. And that makes this whole pattern. That makes this whole pattern. So it's not irregular, it's not regular. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a systematized irregularity. If, they, if the first one would be different, the whole pattern would be different. It would be similar, but it would be different. Now since it's expanded metal, it's not like perforated metal, it's not, it has an orientation. If, if they stretch it in the factory, it, it, it gets an orientation. So if you look from it, from one side it looks fully open. You look from the other side, it looks closed, right? So you get closed pieces and fully transparent pieces. And it's just because of the orientation of the, of the hexagon. So we always follow, there's always the orientation that goes with the, 
with a hexagon. So the orientation would be like here, there, and there. And of course, because it, that's also stainless steel, you get this huge effect with, with sunlight. So almost like zinc crystals, right? When you have a galvanized piece of steel, you get, you get this orientation plus the metallic effect of, of reflection. You get this incredible information from the surface when you walk around. It's like there's this constant there's this constant orientation and reorientation of your body because when you move around, the thing seems to change, right? So there's, it's like the music and the, and the visual information do this, a similar thing. You see what you're hearing and you hear almost what you're seeing, right? You get this sort of synesthetic effect. It's not a moiré pattern, but it is a, a pattern that works with the movement. Now I'm going to try out an, a word <laughs> for, because people ask me, uh, I wrote this little piece about it and I always say, well, I think it's pretty ugly when people ask me, do you think it's beautiful? Or <laughs> and there's, there's a, and, and, uh, that, uh, clearly it's not ugly, so I can. <laughs> And clearly, I don't think it's ugly, but when we, we say in the office, now it's really ugly, we actually mean it's really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this is actually what we should call sensuous. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> now beauty, beauty, what the thing that Kant killed, what beauty is proportion, harmony, divine laws that shape an object. And then Kant sort of cracked that, and, he, and then the sublime came up, right? And the sublime is this notion of chaos, right? So every object is sort of haunted by chaos, by these huge natural forces. The problem I have with that, and of course the sublime just goes on to and on and on and on till, the, till deep in the 20th century, and all the Donald Judds and all the Rothkos and all the Eisenmans and the Rosalind Krauss and basically totally obsessed by the sublime, right? And what is the sublime? It's just a, it's an overscaling of the natural forces because suddenly you get so much abyss, right? You get so much chaos that what, what can we do? Nothing. We just stand passively in awe, right? Feeling the terror and the fear for these natural forces. So God is replaced by the devil. Exactly what Mar Maria Pross wrote in the Romantic Agony is that the, the axis of good of the universe was replaced by the axis of evil. So good or evil, both they're like transcendent forces, right? So what do you get? You get pure judgment, you get pure contemplation, you get pure distance. So basically, my argument is that both the sublime and, and the beautiful are, are for the mind, are for the mind. And this is something that is really about the body. It's really about the body. So we are uh, dozing the forces. We're, <laughs> we're dozing the forces in such a way that the body keeps involved or stays involved or is involved in such a way that it starts to move and explore. Now this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous because when you open up an object to, to action, when you basically move perception to action, right? People just do Pavlovian things, right? What I saw in the water pavilion, people just run around, hit buttons, whoop, <laughs> run around. They had, they had to stop children because they went out of the building, get back into the building, come out of the building, get in. They just went nuts <laughs> because of the pure reactivity right, of, of activity. If you see any interactive exhibition, you just see kids hitting red buttons. <laughs> they don't look at the screen where they paid all the money for explaining how dinosaurs, whatever, how they got extinct. They, they just hit the red button. <laughs> <laughs> so if you make something interactive, you have to be very, very careful. Now this is a double interactivity. One is electronic, right, so there is a, there is a response 
of the system. It modulates. You are not composing because you're a bad musician as a visitor, right? You're not composing, but you're influencing the composition so that it recomposes and makes you hear something else. So you're in a studio or in an orchestra, you're part of it, but you're not composing. You're part of, of the, f the set of forces that make the composition. That's the electronic interactivity. The other, the plastic one, is actually something that could do without electronics because the shapes are continuously changing. So that's, it's the form of change. It's not the actual change. It's not a, a, a wall that turns from blue to green, but it actually is a wall that has the form of transformation. So it's sort of a higher order, sort of a higher order. And that's exactly that sort of multiplication of orientations, that constant transformation, making structure, by the way, that's actually, that's interactive. That's interactive. There's no way you can stand still in front of this thing. The first, there's no front, and then there's no corners, right? So where do you stand? You just keep on looking. I'm not sure if you guys know in sculpture, there's, there, in mannerism, there was this moment where the frontal statue changed into this figura serpentinata, where you actually had a bunch of figures that were all S-shaped, and they were locked into each other. I just saw it again in Florence. Amazing. Amazing. You stand in front of it, you immediately start walking. Because like two-thirds of the statue is around the corner. So you, ha you have to move, and while that, that movement is a totally different space, right? There's a totally different space than the cart space, the X, Y, Z, just going around. This is a space that is intensive. It's not an ex extensive, neutral space around an object. It's actually the space of how it stirs up feelings and emotions and moods, of course, you have to be receptive for it. If you're like in a bad mood, you just go from here to there. <laughs> it's like 70% of the people in the water pavilion just go from A to B. They do five minutes. <laughs> so there, you need some kind of uh, irritability or uh, sensibility for the sensuousness, right? So I'm just going to hang that word sensuous in the air. Of course, it's not sensual. Right, but it's sensuous. There's a, there's a certain directness in the relationship with the body, but on the other hand, it's not as direct as a purely neurostatic tickling of ears and, and eyes, right? It's, it, it's, a, it's a step further, but not till it reaches, let's say, the cortex. <laughs> Sorry, it's extremely happy. It's a... It's a Dutch brain park, a uh, business park. It's a, what we call a brain park. So we get these. Yeah. <coughs> the D Tower is, um, is also interactive, but in, an, in another way, much slower way. I'm really interested in this idea of so, sort of slowing down interactivity and bring it to the sort of level of architecture. The D Tower is a, is a project I did with Kuya uh, Serafijn, a Rotterdam artist. And he wrote a set of questions on four emotions, love, hate, happiness, and fear. Actually, it's like 420 questions. Every year in the city of Dutichem, which is 50,000 people, f 50 people are selected from all neighborhoods, from all zip code areas, in all ages, all sex, whatever. So a really representative selection. They get the password. They type in the password, and then they do, each, each four days, they do a number of questions. <coughs> this is not the right URL. It's actually www.d slash torrent in Dutch dot nl. So you can look it up, and it, and it really works very well. So, but you cannot see, you cannot really see who is doing what. And let me explain the questions first. So I'm afraid in my direct environment, I'm happy with my relations, I love my relations. These are, these are very simple questions. These are February questions. <laughs> they develop over the year, and they get more inquisitive and more, more Dutch. <laughs> How often do you hit your children? <laughs> right? Hit, uh, do you hate your boss? Whatever. There's all this typical Dutch interior stuff, and and they they mark they mark the the answers, and these are graphed. And the graphs you can see on the, on the website. So you cannot see the questions, but you can see the graphs of emotions. Fear in general. So these are the peaks. Underneath here, there's a line, a virtual line with all the zip code areas from 7,000 to 9,000. 
and you see peaks. So you get peaks of fear in certain neighborhoods. <laughs> That's awful. That's <laughs> then this is the fear in general. You can click on fear and, and environment, yourself, and property. And we're building up a huge archive. We're building up a huge archive of all these emotions and moods in the city. You can, you can see now, you can just look up in the archive Fear, fear and environment, that question, how was that doing over there and there? That's quite amazing. And that also for love, hate, and happiness. Now basically the, 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 the idea was of the client to build a tower. And we said, no, we want a website. And he said, yeah, it's okay if you do a tower. <laughs> so they tripled the budget uh, so we could do a, a, a questionnaire, a website, and a tower. Now the tower, this I'm going to skip. This is Nicolas Schiffer. Nicolas Schiffer in the 50s he and 60s, he did, um, uh, he designed uh, a tour cybernetique for Paris. This is actually 500 meters high. And it's quite an amazing idea. Actually the, the, the lighting system of the tower would visualize all the invisible traffic in the city. So like telephone, usage, uh, money, uh, the stock market, cars, all kinds of stuff would be visualized in this, in this tower as a, as a sort of cybernetic monument. It's amazing. Nicolas Schiffer has done amazing work. It's a pity it never got built. He built a small one somewhere in the, in the north of France, but it wasn't really successful. So not really interactive, but showing, let's say, the invisible. So when I started with the tower, I started with this fear that I animated to actually disappear and contract and expand and become large. I didn't know actually what to do, so <laughs> I started with a sphere, which is actually a bad start for a tower. <laughs> and uh, so there, in the this is a book page. There you actually see that object, so frozen, right, from stop motion. There you get that object. We actually made it in, into a, a three-dimensional thing. And here's my first Fry Otto book. And I'm actually looking at this. There's a very tiny image. It's this one. And I thought, well, when I sort of blow up a balloon, like for a quarter, and I tape it, I blow it up again for a half, and I would get iterations of, of, of pneumatic volumes that would sort of be similar to that one, and then I would hang it on a cable, and I would have a sort of tower. But that's not very durable, so I looked at the other image, which is the shopping bag, and I thought, I, okay, I, I have actually, I have the content of the shopping bag, but I don't have the handles. So I was thinking to actually analyze the shape by, by strapping it, by hanging it like this shopping bag, right? And you would actually follow the geometry with the lines. Again, sort of a line surface problem. The lines would come out with a certain tangent, right? And all four are interrelated. So that we digitized, we turn it upside down, that's, that became that one. Now, aesthetically, you would have to understand this tower as a Gothic object. Uh, let me show you the object. This is, there's, there's columns, and the columns uh, bifurcate, and the lines that are coming out are weaving, and while they weave, they create a vault. All right, so, oh, let me just go back. That's exactly what a Gothic structure is. Because Gothic, Gothic aesthetics is based on continuity, not on elementarism. Classicism is based on elements, right? Like modernism. You have columns, you have voids, you have fenêtre à longueur, you have whatever. Here you have the architrave, you have the dome, you have the elements. And these can never surpass themselves, right? There's a system that organizes them, like in Palladio, but the elements are the elements. In Gothics, there's something much more abstract going on. There's actually ribs, and the ribs are sort of quasi-structural, half-formal, half-structural elements. And when enough ribs bundle together, they become a column. 
right? So a column is actually a result of a procedure. When the ribs weave, right, they become a vault. So this, this, this idea of the flexible rib is actually a whole system that can generate variation. That's why all these old Gothic vaults are so incredibly different and beautiful. And that's why all these classical domes are always the same and so terribly ugly. <laughs> so now I'm saying that this is actually beautiful. And this whole aesthetics is, is, is this Gothic principle, follows this Gothic principle of, of continuity. Of course, it's not a Gothic tower in the sense of its verticalism and its, its sense of structure, but it is, it is Gothic in the sense of, of its, its morphology. Here you see there's, there's all these digital variations. Um, to actually make the panels, we use the CNC milling technique where you see here, this is the milling machine goes to a certain depth, in this case, uh, 40 centimeters. So each of the panels has to make, made, be made out of blocks of 40 centimeters deep. So this is the smallest panel. Now, just look at this, this diagram. You see that there is repetitions in here. So panel A is repeating three times, panel E is two times, panel C three times the tube four times, and some of them are called NS non-standard. So these are not repeating. So an object that is 200 square meters large has 100 square meters of mold surface. Very important, because molds are as expensive as the surfaces. So you need tools of control, right? You need tools of control. So this is actually the A panel. There you see there's A1 and this is A2. And these are glued together and they make the object, right? So it looks like a, a totally non-standard, wild, extraterrestrial, while it's actually a fully controlled, gothic, traditional architectural <laughs> object. Well, it's, it's not really standing, let's say, in the Gothic manner. This is the legs. It's almost like hanging from the ground. These, there's, there's huge compression here. This, there's this tension here. It's actually hanging from the ground. And the shape, of course, if it would be Gothic, it would be symmetrical in all directions. And this one is not symmetrical, again, because of this idea of, of the movement around it. So there's this local movement of the object. There was a huge discussion about the ugliness of the, of the object. <laughs> Especially the people living around it tried to, to stop us building it. <laughs> and uh, we had a hugely, uh, well, sort of very warm evening with the inhabitants. And uh, they said, yeah, but it's so ugly. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is exactly ugly. and. Uh, and I, tell, I told the story of my sister having this baby, which, which the whole family was like gathered around the baby. And I thought, my God, it's such an ugly baby. <laughs> and everybody was adoring it and touching it and holding it. And I said, yeah, you basically, you will, you will see this as your, <laughs> as your infant, right? Because it's so innocently ugly. Yeah, that helped. But actually, I, I'm not really sure if that's the correct. There is a certain ugliness that you need to be able to touch something. I think that that's correct. That's at least correct. But there's a, there's a clearly there's a there's this beauty of of uh, of counting and articulation, and of flexible coherence, which which I find extremely aesthetic. So the computer can, of course, check all the answers. So if, if love is on number one that day, it turns red, right? All the, all the answers, all the responses are, are, are weighed. So in the end, you can just add them up. So when the lampposts go on, the tower also goes on in the color of the day. It actually, this is love, it's on third place. And uh, since it's Holland, 
happiness is on first place. But hate is a very good second. So, and, and that's interesting because the moment when, you, this is a, a very important uh, point in the city, when you drive in, people returning from work will see that it's green. And it immediately refers to the to feelings, to the intensive, right, to the mood of the city. So y when you go home, you you check, right, <laughs> how hate is doing. If you live there, it's a real tool. And they see, okay, in that neighborhood, it's going like this with hate, and that's why love is not winning. It's a really interesting site. There's hot issues that are discussed. And it's interesting because the people have aliases, but you can see the street names, not numbers, but you see the streets. So you see where <coughs> they live, but you don't actually s know who they are. Right? There's, uh, there's a slight anonymity, anonymity. And now I get older, so I start breeding projects. So this is a, actually I have the idea with the, with the artist to actually franchise the tower <laughs> and sort of try to build them all everywhere. And Madrid was a very good candidate. And this is for a city in Switzerland where we, built, where we wanted to build a huge one. They, they turned it down, <laughs> which is a pity. Uh, it's, a, it's a very small city. So actually, we were not doing the emotion thing. We were actually looking at traffic because it's a small town. It actually uh, becomes five times larger in winter. And it doubles in size in the summer. So just in between, it's like 5,000 people. But there's this huge scaling because it's a, it's a tourist winter sports city. And you would drive up the you would drive up the 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 mountain, and you would see this thing. You would, you would see it. <laughs> and at day, it's it's this sort of glowing structure, almost like a a glowing structure. And at, at night. It, it glows. <laughs> it's good you all like it. Just <laughs> <laughs> so for the, for the original people, there would, there would be uh, cables, glowing cables in the top. And for the, for the weekend tourists, you get the, the route. And, w and when it's fully, oh, when, it's, when it's like fully winter, the whole thing would sort of glow up. So actually we were looking at different streets in the city and we, and we were mapping these streets onto the object almost like a, <laughs> like a nervous system <coughs> and would glow at night so you could actually see sort of the tension between the, the originals and the, and, the, and the tourists. Now let's say this, a, a similar, a similar idea of, of a porous network of an of a, of an uh, of a net applied here to a pop music center in France, and now I'm going to show like four architecture projects, all totally tight and typological and straight, fairly straight. So almost all like rectangular plans and just to get this misunderstanding out of the way that we do blobs or free form. <coughs> I just hate that word free form. It's like the, the, the worst word in architecture. You should kill, kill anybody who uses that word. <laughs> so again, a Fry Otto. IL means in Institute for Lightweight Structures, IL 33 on Radio Laria. This is amazingly beautiful books. And here there's a, a, a stretched piece of, uh, of varnish. So it starts stretching. It's very tiny. This is often like a few millimeters. And the whole form of the system is derived from an iteration of tearings. So a first tearing, a second tearing, and a third tearing. There's no way you can just model this. You first have to do that one, and then that, and then that. One follows after the other. Now, since it's a pop music center, it's, it's based on, a, on, a, on the hall, right? It's almost like a hanger. And the hanger is made out of nine bands. And the bands basically can do two things. One is span over a large space. 
and the others organize a, a row of rooms in a corridor. So extremely basic. So here you get basically you get the program in a sort of a, a slightly smaller version because this one is bigger and that one is smaller. So we start with a version that is totally mechanical. It looks at all the behavior in the program without any flexibility or with any extra activity. Everything here is mechanistic. So they're almost like a nouvelle look at events, right? Everybody goes from A to B, does nothing else. And here, the structure starts opening up to the major streets, and here it starts to generate effects between the openings. So here you get clubs and patios, so you get more vaguer functions, right? They go beyond the mechanical, and they start to create like areas that are less defined functionally. And here it, it, it fully developed into a system of clubs that relate between studios, a huge concert hall, a smaller concert hall, backstage. So there's all this mechanical program mixing with vague program. I have to use that word. I will come back to it. Vague program. Vague is really interesting. Vague is actually, it's a word from logic, which is now often translated as fuzzy, but actually v the idea of vagueness is, is 2,000 years old. The Greeks already discussed vagueness. How vague is, the, is, for instance, the term red, right, or the length of somebody. So vague is actually, there's this beautiful text of, uh, of uh, Brian Masumi in the book, and he uses the quote of, of C.S. Pierce. And Pierce says, vague is not determined to be vague. It's actually determined to be determined, right? It's a sort of something that is to be determined. So it's not determinately nothing. It's actually a, a state of determinism, but it's a flexible state of determinism. So in vagueness, you get determined states. You get determined states, but the in-between is also materialized. It's exactly like a D tower. There's a column, there's a vault, but in between it's vague, which is extremely difficult for engineers, right? They know what a column is, they know what a vault is, but if there's something in between, it makes them nervous. And you really need finite element analysis to solve that problem. You really have to look at the object not as, an, as a building engineer, but as a car or boat engineer that basically looks at surface as a load-bearing element than at architectural elements. Now Cecil Bowman, when he saw, sorry, when he saw the D-Tower, he says, ah, there's ambiguity in there. And he said, well, Peter Rice always hated ambiguity. But vagueness is not ambiguity. Ambiguity is actually two determined states overlapping, like Venturi, right? You would have a column and a vault, you overlap them. But it's, it's still language, but it's overlapping, so you sort of, slightly deconstructing. Vagueness is something else. It really materializes something that does not have a name, right? So it's, it's sort of proto-language. It's not language yet. That's really interesting. So it is material, but it's not, it's not architectural language yet. I find that really amazingly interesting. So there's a lot of determinism or crystallizations, right? There's even corridors with rooms, stuff like that. It's almost my first project where I did corridors with rooms. But there's also these open areas that are more flexible and more open. Now this has a very tight budget. So structurally it's based on portals that are bent first within the, fr within the surface of the portal, right? And then also sideways to construct diagonals that actually make it almost like a shell over there. And then, and then covered with corrugated sheet, which is a very special problem because if you have two curves and you connect them with straight lines, that's called a ruled surface, right? That's a ruled surface. You can unfold that ruled surface in Rhino form Z, whatever. Normally, if you do that, the rulers would not be parallel anymore if you unfold it, right? If you take the geometry of the water pavilion, you unfold each of the segments, you get non-parallel tapering rulers. In this case, there's corrugated sheet on top of it. That means that when you unfold the surface, the rulers have to be parallel or else that material doesn't fit over it. Right? That's called a developable surface. So it's a very special kind of ruled surface. 
It's the cheapest ruled surface you can get. <laughs> so these are all ruled surfaces, developable surfaces. You also see, I might add, um, this object relates to the environment, so to speak. So where you get historical buildings or housing blocks, actually the, the curve tried to keep a vertical. So this is actually a facade. So after the water pavilion, everybody thought that I was going to do weird blobs and curling, curving volumes, but actually I'm trying very hard to do facades, right? So this is actually a 90 degrees facade, and it only relaxes here where facade and roof merge in front of the square, right? So there's a very dosed usage of the, of let's say, the, the whole idea of flexibility and, and vagueness. So here, basically, it's less vague than there. So in that sense, all these French projects really sort of tamed me. All right, so it restrained me. This really, is, I mean, France, France is really a good teacher in that sense because you cannot just, you don't get just like square meter program, you get cubic meter program. They also give you the heights of the rooms, right? So you get everything, and everything heights. So that teaches you. Let me just hurry up a bit, because I have seven more to go or something. Ah, oh, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is let's say the most classic. Uh, let's say separation between between uh, tectonics and textile, between a tectonic volume and a textile drapery or surface. This is for the, this is for the cultural capital of, of Europe in 2004, which is Lille at that time. What they normally do, like, like in Graz, they use European money to build a project that of course lasts far longer than just the year of the cultural capital. So, since it's a socialist city, they, they put it in, a, in, a, in a, a sort of almost totally destroyed neighborhood called Vazem, which, is, which looks very much like Detroit, full of holes, and it's, it's just a, a nightmare. And it, but it's full of happy people, students and, uh, and uh, Muslims and uh, Arabs, they got called in French. And, uh, and ex-communists, and it's a very lively, very lively neighborhood. So I had tons of tons of meetings uh, with the mayor, <laughs> Martin Abri, uh, famous socialist mayor. And here I'm trying to explain the project to the Belgian queen. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a look I, I know from... <laughs> <laughs> It's a, a quite an amazing image. Just if you just think about Duchamp and his, and his the large glass, this is Martina Brie with a few female staff, right? And you <laughs> and there you get all the men with <laughs> with these hairy <laughs> and then you get this androgynous <laughs> architect with the queen. This is amazing. So that's an old textile factory and uh, uh, already closed for like 80 years, which was extended till here. So we, we actually uh, restored the old street and cut the factory. Now this is the whole project. So two thirds of, of, of the floor plan is, is renovation. And a third is this new concert hall. Now this they expected that we could do a renovation, but they also expected us to do a sort of blob on the grass over here, like a free form. <laughs> 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 and I said, well, this is such a destroyed area, it's much better to just close the street and restore the facade, which when you were in France, they'd love you when you say that actually. So, <laughs> so I said, yeah, well, I will base my, my 
my work on, a, on an analysis of the vertical structure of the, of the old factory and just modulate, a ser do a serial modulation of, of a vertical system. So in here we have uh, um, an exhibition uh, space, then we have offices, we have a hammam, a Turkish bath in the, in the basement, we have a library, we have a cyber cafe, we have a maison d'artiste where artists in residence can work, we have a, a concierge, we have a salle à manger where local residents can organize parties. So it's, it's really about how to weave, let's say, local desires into this global let's say, network of art and artists that are always exhibiting here. And this is a theater with a foyer, some studios, so local bands can also play there. This is the foyer. This is actually the, 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 the inside. So on this side, the facade is actually doubled and it's partly going over the old uh, factory, which is over here. So that's a, a really interesting fabric. It's, it's used for uh, conveyor belts. It's a very high quality uh, stainless steel. And the, actually the quality is that when you light it in a certain way, it becomes transparent. If you light another way, it becomes reflective. So you can play a lot with this idea of, of, <coughs> of, of movement and lighting. And it, it has an incredible effect because uh, with the sunset you get this, but the of course, it's a facade, but it's not a French facade, right? Where you stand still in front of the of the axis of the facade. It's actually it's it's a it's a facade that you have to move by, right? Because with every step you do, the lighting changes. So the the glow, the glow on the, on the facade has a direct effect on on again on your on your feelings and how you take decisions, right? I, of course, seventy percent, uh, ninety percent is just driving through the street, but you can actually see that the surface itself is like an event, right? When people start walking up and down, you see the interactivity at work, right? You see the vagueness sort of almost like igniting, firing up people, which is not a, it's not a neutral space around this, right? It's, it's really a hot glowing space, which, which, that you need to feel. It's very difficult to photograph, actually. <laughs> and of course, this is done because a, a theater in a, in a residential area is, is a, it would be a closed block, right? In a, in, a, in a neighborhood of houses would be a nightmare. So you, the surface really needs a very careful treatment. <coughs> the Pompidou is, a, is a, a, again French. But it has, again, this, this combination of textile and tectonics. But here the tectonics and textile really sort of weave together. You have to read it as a, as a system, right, where, where we have a, s a sort of Sainsbury typology, which is transformed, which is transformed by bifurcation of, of portals, and then a second bifurcation into a shell, right? So this would be the Sainsbury Right, this would be a foster, and then it it starts to break. The balloons start to break. Right, you see the the portals start to bifurcate, and then network and become a shell. So you have single curvature here, double curvature there. So it's a, it's a really a, a sort of progressive geometry, fully steered by 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 structural means. So th this is, again, first an analog technique, and then it, there's a digital technique to, that really follows the program, which is done in subdivision surfaces in Maya. And this is scripted in MEL. So basically, I have, I have two groups in the office. One is working on the program, and the other is working on, let's say, how to script that, that transformation. So basically, what we do is put this volume over that one, and then the MEL scripts generates this Right, so that basically the forms according to the sets of bifurcations. So we go from this one to that one to that one. <laughs> you see here, there's there's wings, there's vertical articulation, there's a dome. Right, so there's wings, there's vertical articulation, and a dome. <laughs> now you all laugh, right? That's okay. 
basically I want to say that we have to be very careful by by using these tools to sort of explode architecture. I'm I'm re I'm really looking at these projects because I'm interested in architectural problems. And these are architectural problems. How do you solve the problem of horizontal and vertical? Jesus. So how do you weave in the verticals in that system? <coughs> of course, in classic, with classic elementarism, you can only do that with a certain sets of dotted lines behind it that generate the system. In this case, it's all done on with variation, right? So basically, there's pure continuity. There's pure continuity of this geometry and that one. I didn't put on a dome, right? I used the technique of weaving to actually generate the massing, right? So the massing is not prefixed like this one. The massing is actually an outcome of this structural weaving technique, which I think is very, very important. If you look at work from Herzog or Hall or whatever, the sorry, the volumes still come from this fully modernist conception of, of massing, and then they're dressed up with either porous systems or nicely folding surfaces. It's all very beautiful, but basically there's no relationship between the texture and the massing. And what I'm arguing for here is actually to use structure in a, in a flexible way, in a topological way, to use structure to one way generate texture and the other way generate massing. Right? And the more you control that, the more aesthetic the outcome is. So basically here, two-thirds of the volume, single curvature is the single curvature is all stainless steel panels and the double curvature is all epoxy panels. So that's also, there's a translucency of the dome right, that lets in the daylight to light the program. Since it's the Pompidou 2, I guess you all know the story. One by Shigeru Ban. It's actually lighting all the museum spaces above here. Also, the plan is fully urbanist, right? The plan has these huge spaces, what they call in the, the forum, the Grand Nef, where you have these huge spaces for large artworks, which is totally different than the smaller spaces up there. So this is much more urbanist solution, this is much more an architectural one. So that's the, that's the ground plan. You see there's these huge spaces, black boxes, and it develops upward according to this balloon system. Now, let me just show you. Um, here are some more balloons, Fry Otto. You put balloons in a box, you pour plaster over them, you, you have it dry up, you puncture the balloons, that's what you get. A four-legged foam system. It's incredible. It's incredible. So that's what we're using for the museum rooms. So here you actually see that the whole structure is like this block of foam spanning from here to there. So we don't use like beams and columns. It's like this whole structure, all the stories are like one structural system. Also allows you to have rooms hanging in the voids. You can see over here. Here you see sort of transformations where you go up. Here you see these sort of three-legged nodes, the rooms. <coughs> and here it gets fully rounded at the top with the restaurant. Of course, the Pompidou 2 also has a restaurant at the top. It's a very interesting program. It's basically the Pompidou of 1977 <laughs> plus the correction from 95. So it's, it's, it's two pianos. There's sort of quasi-transparency on the ground floor and then a lot of typical museum spaces and three or four different scales in between with the restaurant on top. Now, this is a, a library from Mexico and uh, this is, let's say, the, the, the most configurational project. Um, looking at Henri Labrouste as a as a typology for a library is a, is a sort of very sensible thing to do. And then the topologizing, let's say the, the, f the flexibilization of that, of that system is done with different figures, an O figure, an A figure, a Y figure. Actually, the Y figure is merging two bands into <laughs> one, you see? So that's a Y figure. 
And then there's, of course, the I figure. So there's four different figures in different amounts of variation, different degrees of variation. A lot of O, not a lot of O, right? A bit of A, combinations of A and Y, A, Y, and O, whatever. In the section, and also three-dimensionally. So you get a whole set of, of variable structural systems, which are also used for air conditioning, to hang the floors. Right? And every time you get in an A, a Y, or an O figure, we leave the floor out. So again, a porous system and all the, the, the openings are related to each other because of the configurational technique. You cannot just add up one figure with another. There's a whole carpet, a whole three-dimensional carpet. That's Heppold. So there's, there's the cold air. There's air being ventilated between two glass facades. So you see the Labrust. You see the Labrust. There's sort of not two bays, but three bays, right, that are constantly transforming. So a rectangle that becomes this trapezium sized site, right, with a constant variation of, of, of spaces. You see that the structure goes very close to texture. Right, so they start weaving so much <laughs> that you actually get the, 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 the textured effects of Lille, right? the textured effects of Lille and the structural effects of the, of the portal system of the, of the Nancy project. So it's real merging of the, of the two <coughs> uh, sort of paddles to block the light. You have reading balconies outside. It's a huge program, like 40,000 square meters. Let's see if I, yeah, there's a plan. So here you see these openings, how you get in, reading lobbies. So it's not like Seattle where, the, where you break up a generic volume and actually the whole area where it's broken up is pure window outside, right? It's just a connection to the urban. In this case, they, they create internal openings and you see that in any o every opening, you, g you get a gathering of the tables, which is almost like Dutch structuralism, right? Every time when you open up, you actually uh, create a void, you connect people. I mean, it's not a socialist program, but it's, it's clear that when people sit reading here, they see these and down and below. Yeah, we actually put a big German blonde girl in to see if we could win, but that didn't help. <laughs> well, it's for Mexico, so I thought maybe. <laughs> so that's the foster triangles, now, now outward, not inward, very similar to the Sainsbury. Of course, in the Sainsbury, there's no secondary, secondary structure here. There is secondary structure in the glazing itself. And you see there's a constant variation of, of openings, right? There's this, there's this street of the ground floor connecting a children's museum to a cinema complex. And this is actually all public space. You actually walk through the library and you see that the, the weaving of the columns actually connects to the, makes it connect to the library. You get this huge arena of, of, of reading. And symmetry. I discovered symmetry. <coughs> so one tiny more, um, Gloucester Cathedral used for Harry Potter movies. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Mucha, Alphonse Mucha with this total incredible obsession for, for hair. And of course, Art Nouveau is obsessed by hair. It's, it's the most dreamy image. Also, of course, water plants, but often the water plant motif is used like hair. And you see the same with Horta. You get the mergings, right, of hair, and you get the crossings. Well, it's so interesting. Graphically, the crossings become as structural as the mergings would be materially, because you have a merging, you get a bundle of hair like a bundle of steel with Horta. And then where they cross, there's a sort of quasi-accidental 
structural connection, which I find really amazing. So this is the last one, an artwork for Rotterdam. Um, so you get the hair. <laughs> it's a bit large. It's, I, th this, I actually don't know. This is like 40, 50 meters or something. But they didn't give us a budget. So that's it's very dangerous to do with when with me. <laughs> it's like, and these are like the Gothic windows. They they actually start to like weave and connect and make structural connections, but also like a, like the window itself becomes a space. And again, here I'm working with Edwin uh, van der Heide, and we're actually using we're using the wind to generate singing. And it's, it's a girl's voice is incredible. He wrote this incredible program that is is constantly changing the tones of voices in vowels. So he has like a huge prol proliferation of vowels from A to I and I to U and whatever. And they always split up. The A can split up in different other vowels. So there's a constant sort of forking or bifurcation of, of sounds and vowels in this one. So basically, we just look at each other's work as a, as a diagram. I could take his stuff and make a building for it, and he could take my stuff and make sound on it. And again, uh, uh, in, th in this case, I use glass for this, this the mosaic effect of uh, the, the faceting that you get with 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 jewelry, right? That you with the lighting, you get these huge reflections and highlights. So this is, I mean, going from the morphogenetic to something that is more controlled and aesthetic. I think the last two are really on that on that level. That are much more controlled in their movements and how these movements relate to each other and actually make one system. That has a much more aesthetic, sensual, sensuous, sensuous effect. That I that I find really sort of totally necessary. In, in architecture. So if you go through the book, right, you start at the beginning, you just skip the water pavilion because that's pretty controlled. But you see pre projects like Beechner's or V2 that are f p almost like pure movement. Hardly any structural connections. And then you get the analog techniques like starting with the wet grid in, 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 in Nantes where you get where the movement becomes structurally absorbed. Here this movement is even more controlled to not just make it structurally coherent, but aesthetically, aesthetically coherent and readable, and much more quiet and calm. <laughs> Doesn't get cheaper, though. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would have to hear the sound. Okay, that's it. Sure, sure. <coughs> Thank you, Lars. Um, should we should we do a few questions? Would anybody like to start? Yeah, we've got one right here. Um, question is, uh, you mentioned about digital computing and analog computing. Um, how do you move in between those two? Um, because your analog computing seems to have a lot of uh, dynamic properties in the forces that it uses. And the fact that you said that um, um, each element has hi hierarchy, they depend one another, one cannot stand without the other, and there's an emergence out of their interactions in between. Now an example that I pick would be the Sano, uh, the, the Sano House. Um, you had a white paper and a purple paper. The purple paper would not exist without the white paper, but the white paper was taken out in the actual building, but then the building still stands although you mentioned that it would be impossible to draw or model without uh, the interaction between the elements. Well, it's not that it disappears, it's actually taken up by the purple. 
So if you, if you look at the white paper, it's extended or it's, it's swept sideways by the purple paper. doesn't mean it's disappeared. It's just taken up in, the, in another system. So lines get taken up in surfaces. doesn't mean it disappears. It just, it's not there actually as arches, but actually as the section of vaults, which is basically what an arch is, right? So it, in that sense, it doesn't disappear. Uh, maybe as a part of that, though, it, the, the question of the relation between the digital and the physical modeling, which was also part of that question, does it move in stages or sequence? Do they go continually back and forth? Is there a major material computational moment and then we shift into, as you said, the analog models tend to sort out a set of rules which then are built into a digital tool or a software or an algorithmic system? Well, basically, if you can see from the lecture that some projects have like 10 stages of m machine stages. Others have three yeah. and others have one. Here I'm just looking at the hair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at the hair. I'm taking up the hair and we're modeling. Of course, there are relationships. There are relationships, but nothing is really generated in that sense. Yeah. Others, other, like the, the, the Nancy project, the Pop Music Center, it's basically di diagramming directly onto steel. It's another type of steel, it's hot steel, it's still bendable steel, but it's quite direct. Yeah. Like it, it, it uses the steel almost like one to one, right? Almost like, like, like the, the viscous, uh, the lacquer. Something like Sonohouse is very typical for an art project. Basically, I had no idea where I was going. I was just, I had just found out about these wool threads and I was just going to systematize them and I was going to use multiple techniques, right? So I was thinking about these lines that I would have multiple slack, and it just started with that. And we have 20 models of them. We have 20 models of them. And that's typical. That's, I mean, sometimes, I mean, like research and design are really like totally different forces in, in a project. Because research wants to develop horizontally. Right? You want to get more, you want to get a better overview. How does the system work? You don't want to really push it into a project. That's what design wants. The design wants to go to the next stage. Right? So when we have 20 of these white paper models, we start like weighing them. We say, okay, that one is better than that one because this performs like this. And then we choose a few. It's almost like rabbits. Right? You put the rabbits together, some come out, you say, okay. So they get a tiny office Darwinism. And then this, I did not know beforehand that I was going to do the, the purple paper. It's just when I saw it on the board, I thought, geez, that's ugly, that, that's bad, sorry. That's bad to actually have these lines jump on a surface that doesn't interact with the lines. It was this passive board and there was all these active lines and they didn't interact. And then I thought, I should actually have a system that generates surfaces. That was the idea. But with others, like the Pompidou, I know exactly what I want. It's, I do sketches, not that the machines are built to produce a sketch. But the moment I do these sketches, I already know that I'm going to do a certain type of balloon machine. The only question then is, are we going to do them vertically or are we going to hang them from the ceiling with, let's say, yeah. balloons filled with water or something? So you get all kinds of practical decisions. So I do some sketches, and sometimes like 10, sometimes like 100, but they also always result in a machine. Right? They always result in a machine. We never say, now we're going to model that sketch. No, we're actually going to build a machine for, to actually, that is capable of producing that. So you get, actually I drew it, it's a totally ugly drawing. It was, yeah, I have to be very careful with the word. It was, it was actually in the, in the Pompidou exhibition, I showed all these hand drawings. So you can see, okay, there's these, the idea of the bifurcations, and, and then we built that machine. But actually, the moment when we have the analog machine, we know that we cannot do 15,000 square meters of program represented by balloons, right? Because some spaces can have the curve of a balloon, other spaces will be totally straight. So that's how we got to subdivision models, right? You know from a subdivision just two clicks away from a box mm -hmm. or two clicks in the other direction for a sphere. So, and that makes it controllable. You can actually see that the boxes are all on the ground, so no clicks. And at the top, they're all balloons, so four clicks. Mm -hmm. And that's how we build these machines. So we, we use analog and digital, and then we proceed digitally. 
because only the digital you can parameterize, right? You can actually build buttons on the machine, either three or four or five, and you can say, okay, this goes there. That you can tune it, right? You can tune it. Other but questions? Should we go? Yeah. I'm interested in the uh, D Tower, and actually I went there and uh, went around and w was asking so a couple of people what they think about it. And one of the comments was uh, in extreme situations, for example, somebody was killed in a street. It didn't show it immediately, and they didn't like this because they said, well, it was red. Yeah. Showing love, whereas there was an extreme situation happening uh, there. So, what is your thoughts about these? Yeah, that's actually what I find interesting about it. it when we when we designed it was like it designed in ninety eight ninety nine. It took us like for four years to go through all the politics, because at a certain moment, the politics said, "Yeah, we have to get a, a tower that really represents, right, or is about health." or it's about certain issues, and we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to do that. We wanted a tower that is about emotions, right, but doesn't fluctuate that much. It's really about the emotions themselves and not about meaning or about politics. It's really about that intensive itself. Well, that's a question. The emotion about that event, yes, but not about their lives. Not about their mother-in-law, their mortgage, their children going to school. So it's really about that. It's really about that. And it's also just sort of, I mean, architecture, especially, let's say, a monument like that, is totally on, let's say, the memory side of building, right? Almost like Nielsen on his, on his uh, column. And of course, experience is about the now, right? It's always, it's, and since we were doing interactive work, it's always like, okay, you guys are totally interested in the present, in real time, experience, whatever. And what I'm trying to do is actually build bridges between memory and, and present. So that in that sense, the detour is on purpose is pretty slow. It's really sort of almost like a, like a transforming monument. But it's, the idea of the monument is still in there. Okay, I think we'll stop there. Lars, thanks very much. Thanks for the lecture. Next to the hotel, yeah. Is it next to the foster?